Well, hey, Kingsville, so glad that you decided to worship with us uh, today. Hey, before we get started, I uh, just want to draw your attention to the drop-down menu uh, on your computer or in the comment section on Facebook. I'd love to know that you were here, uh, whether you're a first-time guest or you've been with us every single week. Uh, there should be a tab uh, or a link that can uh, point you to an electronic connection card. I just want to encourage you to fill that out because that helps me know you were here, but also know how we can connect you with our church and also how to pray for you. So I just want to point you to that. We'd love for you to fill it out before our time's closing today. I want to introduce you to a guy I just love to death. This is Paul Kugel. Uh, his wife is, is Carly Kugel. They've been uh, they've been in Boston now for, I guess, about a year. Is that right? Almost, yeah. June will be one year. Okay. Yeah, he and Carly, they met in Atlanta. They've uh, served with us as life group leaders. Both are members. And, but they felt this prompting to come to the city because they really had a burden to see this city restored and renewed. And so I, I've asked him to join us uh, as we continue to go through the book of Nehemiah. So, hey, thanks for, thanks for being part of today. Thanks for having me, John. So I'm excited. Yeah, man, grateful for you and Carly. We've been, we've been going through the book of Nehemiah. We, uh, we're at chapter 6. And uh, something really important happened today, excited to share it. But hey, Paul, why don't you kind of just catch us up? Where have we been so far? Yeah, so we saw in the beginning of Nehemiah, he heard a report about the walls of Jerusalem and uh, how the city was uh, in disarray and how the wall was still broken down. And uh, it troubled him. And so in chapter one, we saw four months, as you pointed out with the timeline, four months of Nehemiah spending time fasting and weeping and praying before the Lord, uh, spending time in the secret place with God. And, and from that secret place, uh, we, we read in later chapters uh, that he got a holy ambition uh, from the Lord to go back and to rebuild the wall. So in chapter 2, uh, he uses his position as, uh, as a wine tester for the king, as a cupbearer. Uh, he uses his position to entreat King Artaxerxes. Uh, he, he asks him, if he can have the resources it takes to fulfill this holy ambition from the Lord, which was a pretty bold step of faith, because to, to ask the king of the, the whole known world at that point, can I go back to my homeland and build up the defensive structures of our city? That, that, that could have come across very uh, negatively to the king and could have cost Nehemiah his life. But what you see is that because he had spent time with God, he, he was confident. And what the vision and what in the vision that the Lord had given him, and so he makes the ask, and the Lord has favor. King Artaxerxes grants his request, and in chapter two, the second half, we see Nehemiah go on his journey. Uh, he goes back to Jerusalem, and we see how he uh, shares his vision with the people, and they respond, and they submit to the vision of the Lord. But we also get a small introduction to the opposition. Uh, which we talked about last week. And then in chapter 3, we get what I call the playbook. And so chapter 3 is just a detailed listing of everybody who participated in rebuilding the wall. Like like Bill Belichick's playbook? <laughs> yes, like Bill Belichick's. Okay. If we found Belichick's playbook, it would have detailed uh, explanations of everybody's role and what they're expected to do. And that's all that Nehemiah 3 is. It's a lot of names, but it's a detailed listing of who was doing their role to accomplish the mission of building the wall. So that's chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Nehemiah. And kind of like what you said, just even picking back into where we are now, Nehemiah faced a lot of opposition. Yes. But through perseverance, trust in God, to keep the work going. And now we're in chapter 6. I just want to read a couple of verses to you. This is how it picks up in verse 15. Uh, it says, So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Lul, in 52 days. And when all of our enemies heard it, all the nations around us were afraid and Fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Mm -hmm. And so, kind of like what you were talking about, there's this work that Nehemiah has in his heart first, and it leads him to go and see the city restored. But, I mean, here we have Nehemiah is in the people of God, and it's, I mentioned I wanted to share something awesome, because this is when the, the work finally gets it's done. Here. It's here. It's, it's finished. The, the law's finished. Now, we're going to be pivoting the rest of this book, it, it, most people think, oh, the walls are finished, the book is done, but actually even something greater is about to happen in the people of God, which is spiritual renewal. 
that happens from here on out. But we just want to pause and say, man, like, well done. Like, we're excited that the work is finally finished. Now, we've said a lot over the course of this, uh, this series that we're the church. We're the people of God. We're not called to build walls, right. but we do have a work to do. Nehemiah and the Israelites, the Jews, they had a work to do. We have a work to do. It's not building walls. But it is about building a kingdom. Like this is what, as a church, we are called to. And underline that word, called. So I, I just, you know, for us to be able to, to pause and just uh, be able to savor the fact that the work is done, the calling that God had given Nehemiah, it's finished at least, you know, for this work. There's a greater work to be done. But Paul, we talk about this word a lot. Like the yes. word calling, right? Like this is my... Calling. I would say that a lot. It's actually one of our values. Yes. Calling over comfort. So, hey, can you, what are some misconceptions that people might have over that word calling? What, you know, what would be, how would you describe, define that word calling? How would you unpack our value calling over? Just, there's a lot to that word. Right. Can you just kind of walk us through that? Right. I think uh, in our day and age, it, at least if you come from a tradition like mine, the word calling can be reserved for elite Christians. Uh, and so people might throw around the idea of, you know, you know, uh, he's called to the ministry or he's called into, you know, this special leadership position. And, and the reality of, of the Bible is that uh, God has a calling for, for everybody. Uh, and, and, and there's nobody who can count themselves out of God's calling. And so uh, I, think about, I think about it in terms of brackets, right? So you've got the widest possible bracket is the call that God has to the, the non-believer, uh, to the person who is not a follower of Jesus, the call is very simple. It's repent. Be saved. Uh, I think about in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, the Apostle Paul says that God is using the believers as his ambassadors, and through us he is making his appeal to the world. And so another way to think about that is through the church, God is calling out to the world. What is he calling out? Be saved. Be saved. And so the widest possible bracket that everybody finds himself in is to be called to salvation. Today is the day of salvation. But beyond that, when you read through the Old Testament uh, and the New Testament, God talks about his people and in, in their sense of being called out. Uh, or another word that we think about is consecrated. Uh, and so you have uh, passages like 2 Timothy chapter 1 where Paul is writing to Timothy, he says that God saved us and called us to a holy calling. And that's not some next level Christianity or some elite category. That's every believer is called to a holy lifestyle. You know, before we were reading through Nehemiah, we were studying the book of Ephesians. And in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul's addressing the entire church in Ephesus. And he says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. And he's not talking to just the leaders of the church. He's talking to the entire church. So we can draw from that that every believer is called to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. So I think about the widest bracket of calling being the call of salvation. And then in that narrower bracket, it's the call of every Christian to a holy lifestyle. We, we are called to be set apart. I think about how Nehemiah said last week when we were looking at the opposition. He said, I have a great work. I can't come down. I have a calling. And, and so as Christians, that call will call us to rub, will cause us to rub up against our comfort. Like inevitably, the call of Jesus on your life will cause you to lay down your comfort at some point. Uh, and that's why Jesus has difficult statements like take up your cross. It's because he knows that his call is eventually going to mean your comfort will have to die along the way. I think about Nehemiah, like he he faced this too. I mean, he could have he could have thrown the towel at any point. So right. much opposition. I mean, you could say pursuing what God had asked him to do was very uncomfortable. Yeah. And yet persevered. You know, he knew that God was calling him to do this. And I, yeah, I love I love what you're talking about because what you're saying is that every person has a calling. It's not mystical. Nope. It's it, it's it's been told to us right here. And one thing you said, being called. And I think about this. Our first calling, first and foremost, is we're called to God. Mm -hmm. Like when we talk about salvation, I just can't get over this. Like salvation is relationship. Like that's what we're yeah. calling into. I think about First Peter three eighteen. Paul, why don't you just read that for us? For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. I, I just I love that. Like the whole point 
that God has called out to us is so that we can be in relationship with God. Like that, that is like the greatest relationship. That's the greatest privilege. That is the gospel that we did not have access to God. But because Jesus died for us, forgave our sins, now we can come into God's presence, not as an enemy, but as a friend, or more than that, as a son, as a daughter. Like it is relationship. Like that is the first calling of a believer, calling to God. Man, I just I just love that. Like uh, if I'm if I'm not productive today, like if I don't get anything done on my task list, but I've had like time with my King, mm-hmm. I've I've embraced my calling. Thing about uh, another calling that we have is is community. We're called we're called a community. Uh, uh, Paul, man, read Hebrews ten twenty four and twenty five. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I think about, uh, uh, I think, actually, I think back to our, our men's retreat back in October. We sat around the bonfire and had yes. a lot of s'mores. And, uh, some and of us more than others. I'll swell. be the first to admit. This quarantine stuff is not helping. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's not. You know, it's uh, not. But man, I think about it, it's just a, such a sweet time together. And, and if, but you know, around the bonfire, eating our graham crackers and Hershey bars, whatever. It's like if we don't tend to that fire, the fire goes out. Mm. And I think about like our love for God, our love for one another. The writer of Hebrews actually has some incredible wisdom here. The writer's saying, listen, like one way that we keep our love for God strong where the fire doesn't go out is that we don't neglect to meet with one another. Like the call to community is right there. And uh, just as you're reading the, through the New Testament, this this Christ-like life, there's so many one another's in Scripture. Right? You know, forgiving one another and bearing each other's burdens and loving one another. And I, in fact, you you can't follow Christ without being in community because those things are in there. So think about that calling to God, that calling to community, and and the last calling that every believer has would be that calling to mission. And Paul, read for us 1 Peter 2, uh, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Uh, When I think about being on mission, living together on mission, I think about this verse, proclaiming the excellencies. And what does it mean to be a missionary? It means I'm a news teller. Mm. That's all that I'm. Yeah. I'm just. I'm. I'm proclaiming excellencies. I'm, I'm seeing God. I'm enjoying God. I'm telling other people about it. Uh, it can be when we talk about being on mission, and you know that E word evangelism. Yeah. It can be a little intimidating, but we've talked a lot about how gospel minus mission just equals a club. Yeah, and, and we're noticing right now that COVID nineteen it's it's causing a lot of clubs to shut down, but it doesn't shut down the church. Because we have a we have a mission that God's given us, and uh, you know I think about how do we really pursue evangelism during this time? Mm. Well, if being with God is about relationship, then evangelism or being a missionary or being on mission it's it's really I'm telling people about this one relationship that changes every other relationship, right? Like when I'm when someone is 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 fighting to be understood. Or uh, they uh, they're having you know just problems with you know, feeling lonely. Then I get to talk about Jesus as my companion, mm-hmm. Jesus as my as my brother. Yeah. Like when I'm uh, when I'm listening to people and they're struggling with their workplace and people that are in authority not treated them right, I and mean, that gives me an opportunity to talk about Jesus as a king who mm-hmm. who came to serve, not to usurp. And, or you know people that are just feeling. Uh, they're struggling with a sense of significance or just a sense of fear. Are they going to make it? Are they going to be okay? And I guess we an opportunity to talk about God as my father. And I really, we're all called to this, but it's it's a very, uh, evangelism doesn't have to be intimidating. I just get to talk about my relationship with Jesus and how that relationship changes all relationships. And so I think about that's, that really is our calling. Whether we're quarantined or gathering or scattered or gathered, it's like this calling that you're talking about, it's the calling to be with God, the calling to be in community, the calling to be on mission. Those things, geography may change, vocation may change, you know, what address may, but these callings always are constant. Like, yeah, Paul, you know, in this kind of season we're in right now, if these callings are constant, and this is something that we're, you know, we're invited into by our King, 
Uh, how, how can we live this out? And you know, when, when we look at Nehemiah, like what are some things we can glean from him as far as living out this calling to be with God, to pursue community, to be on mission? Like, walk, walk us into that. You know, lead us into that. I would, I would say the first thing we have to make sure that we have to make sure of is that we keep the main thing, the main thing. And to your point, our first calling is to relationship with God. And I would just beat that drum over and over again. If we approach this not from a place of being loved, if we approach this as how can I achieve some goal or make sure I measure up to some standard of Christianity, then we're, we're not we're not effectively walking in our identity as children primarily. And I love that you just kept coming back to that, that we are primarily in the first and ultimate sense, we are called into relationship with God. So keep that in mind. But I would say uh, the first thing to do is pray. Uh, pray for some Holy Spirit divine creativity. Uh, let's just be honest. This is unprecedented times. And, and no one has life figured out right now. I don't know if you're anything like me, but week six, I'm still fumbling through a schedule and how my life looks right now and how work looks right now. And I think you just got to be able to, to be honest with yourself and with God and 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 ask Him for, for wisdom. Uh, and, and He is, is so willing and gracious to meet you in this unknown time and, and to help you figure out how to go about these things. Uh, when I think about uh, how we pursue community, uh, I think about uh, Nehemiah. In chapter 3, everyone just owns their wall. They own the piece of the wall that was right in front of them. And I know we've already talked about Belichick once. And uh, for all the friends who are watching back home, I'm still not a Patriots fan. I was going to ask you. I'm not a Patriots fan. Even with Brady leaving. Even with Brady leaving, I will cheer for the Atlanta Falcons (laughs) as a native of Georgia. Choke City still has my loyalty. And I would talk more about loyalty even in dark times and how that's gospel truth right I there. Do, but I do admire that. football isn't, uh, isn't what we're here to talk about. But I just think it's, there's some powerful analogies. So the, the Patriots have above uh, their walkout tunnel, they have a statement that says, do your job today. And I just think sometimes we, we overcomplicate it. I think it really is as simple as you doing your job today, just like Nehemiah had a team of people each owning their wall. And so for us right now, that means showing up online. And, and I'll be the first to admit that, that that's hard and, and it's different than showing up in person, but it's so important to show up online. And, and I would just encourage you, show up and be present. We have life group, we have prayer meetings, and we have uh, gatherings after the sermon. And, and when you come into those Zoom spaces, come prepared to share. Uh, come willing to be honest and vulnerable with your brothers and sisters because we need you. Chapter 3, Nehemiah, the wall doesn't get built if not everyone is owning their wall. So show up and be present. But also stay connected to each other. Uh, Pursuing community right now doesn't have to be uh, some fantastic dream world. I think just calling someone and saying, how can I pray for you, is a really easy step in terms of owning your wall and pursuing community right now. So I think about showing up, and I also think about serving right now with our church family. You know, it used to look like set up and tear down. It used to look like King's Kids. It used to look like being on the worship team. But we don't serve in those same lanes anymore in the same ways. And so think about how we can serve people. Even if you're not in the city right now, you can get a letter delivered to a friend. You can have dinner delivered. You can go out and buy groceries for a neighbor. Uh, and, and so when, when I think about pursuing community, I think small, on your wall. And then when I think about mission, I think it's the same thing. I think about the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor. And so maybe now is an unprecedented time where you find yourself at home a lot more. And thus, you're a lot more exposed to your neighbor. And it could be as simple as a care package of hand sanitizer and Lysol wipes. Or it could be a note left on a door that says, hey, I'm printing for you. Or it could be offering to get groceries. I, I just think we, we can't overcomplicate it. I think about the life of Jesus, and it wasn't focused on how can we deliver some product that's going to change the life of every person in this crowd right now. It was the people in front of him. It was the disciples. It was Peter, James, and John. It was the blind beggar asking for his healing. And so Jesus, we, we, we learned when we read through the story of Lazarus that he was willing to engage emotionally with the suffering around him. Like He allowed his heart to be stirred up for the people in front of him. And so I would say 
it, it's it's simple things. When you on your community, it's show up and it's serve. And it's the same thing for mission. You show up and you serve. It just it, it's more simple right now. Uh, and I think we we uh, we get to lean into that simplicity and, and ask God for some creative ways to be ministering to those people around us. Yeah. I think that's a great word. Uh, man, it's you're right. Thinking small, owning our part of the wall. Uh, I loved how you anchored it with Christ. He he just whenever there's a need right in front of him, like that's uh, just just respond by you know by meeting whatever that need is. Uh, I remember uh, not on my notes here, but just the word brought to mind just with uh, with Chelsea. You know, whenever we were dating, and she knew that I really felt called to to pastor, and she's like. Ah, just really have no idea what it means to be a pastor's wife. We just, I don't, I don't know what that role entails. No, and that what didn't go to school for that. And I didn't really feel like that was going to be part of my life. And how do I, you know, how do we do that? And and uh, we just said, hey, let's let's just break it down. Love is uh, meeting the meeting the person's need that's in front of us. Whoever whoever is in front of us, whoever is around us, how can we love them? And uh, it just it just it emphasizes what you're saying, right? Where. How can I love the Kingsill family? How can I love the people that God's put in my life? How can I love the people that are around me geographically? You know, showing up and, and serving. Like it, when you boil it down, it, it can be very simple. And we have Jesus as our guide in that. The Holy Spirit is our empower in that. I just want to mention one more one more thing of how we can kind of pursue this work that God's called us to fulfill. You know, in the Amaya, yeah, we, we definitely see that it's because everybody's doing their part that the law gets built in 52 days, which is crazy. <laughs> 52 days. I, I mean, how long do construction projects happen in Boston? <laughs> they go on forever. And uh, But but everyone's focused on their part. But I uh, also, you know, time and time again, Nehemiah, and we see it in this, you know, this little passage here, that the enemies of the Jews, they're petrified that the laws have, uh, have been finished because in verse 16, they uh, they perceived that this was done with the help of our God. And uh, time and time again, Nehemiah is looking to God, looking to God. And I think about, all right, how can we as a church pursue this calling of deeper fellowship, community, of mission? Well, of course, it's thinking small, but I think also it, it, it's fixing our eyes on God. Fixing our eyes on God. I uh, I really believe that one of the great tools that the enemy wants to put in our hands right now is a mirror. Mm -hmm. And I say a mirror because, you know, when you're constantly looking at yourself, like if, if, if I'm staring at the mirror for any amount of time, like my blemishes are going to start to show up. I'm going to see them. And uh, I think that's the tool the enemy loves to give us because when we're so focused on our world and our wants and our concerns, all that kind of stuff, we, we really become trapped. In fact, I think about uh, uh, this uh, Netflix uh, series I just started Netflix. to watch. During, during the season we're in right, right now, Netflix. Yeah, there's been a little bit of that. A little That's bit. That's right. But it's, it's, called, uh, it's called a lock and key. And really the premise is there's a family that moves into a house and there's magical keys and they, they open up into different rooms and whatnot. And there's one room that's filled with mirrors. And uh, in the in the the room's called the prison of self, and I'm just saying how how appropriate is that, right? If we're if we're always focused on us, I, honestly, I think I think some sometimes that that's what leads to anxiety or depression. It's like when I'm always focused on me, that that is a breeding ground for anxiety, for fear, for concern. I uh, man, I so when I think about fixing our eyes on God, I, I, timely, I just read. Oh, my pen's about to fall. I just read this. Oh no, I'm about to lose. Oh, found it. Perfect. Uh, I read this book this morning. It's such a short little book. It's really just a sermon they turned into a pamphlet. But I, John Stott, uh, incredible theologian, and this is what he said. I think it relates to feeding, uh, to fixing our eyes on God. He says this. He says, "Feed the mind should be uh, the slogan for every Christian, uh, just as a physical body needs uh, healthy food to enjoy, to eat, for the body to be healthy." The mind, uh, what we feed our mind will determine the kind of person we become. Healthy minds have a healthy appetite. And uh, man, I think in this season we're in, where we're, uh, a lot of us are alone, uh, our mind can either be trapped, 
where we're always just thinking about how am I going to get through, how am I going to make it, am I doing okay? So it can be trapped. That would be kind of the mirror room, so to speak. It can grow numb where we, you know what, I just don't want to think about it. So let me, let me scroll, let me watch certain, you know, shows. I, I just, I want to get a, in a way turn it escape. off. Just turn it off. And yeah, that's right. Just escape. Yeah. Or we can be renewed. And I think the way we're, we're renewed is by fixing our eyes on God. Hey, man, well, why don't you read some of the, just anchoring that thought in scripture, just kind of read where we're getting that from. This is Philippians 4, 8. Finally, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Colossians chapter 3 verse 2, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Romans chapter 2 verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. How do we, how do we get out of the trap? How do we become alive and not numb? I, mean, I just think there's some incredible wisdom here. We fix our eyes on God. Like we, you know, first and foremost, we dive into the Word. Like that this is our invitation to get to know God. Uh, so of course, fixing our eyes on God, being in the Word. I mean, if you're able to, you know, some simple application here. If you're able to get out of the house, go for a walk. But I mean, anyone can do that, right? Not just like believers, but like we have an opportunity. Like when we go for a walk. And we see the, the flowers that are blooming, the trees growing. Like We know this comes from a master artist. It doesn't just, oh, that's nice. It, it's like, no, like we know God's behind. I think you actually mentioned this in a blog you wrote or a devotional video that you, I mean, the fact we can go for a walk and like we can get out of our world and see all the beauty that God has put right in front of us. Something that's really helped me through the years has been reading missionary biographies, right? Like it's incredible some of the things, the sufferings they went through, some of the, the, the work that they felt called to do and what they went through. But it, it, it helps me because it gets myself out of my world. And it helps me once again see the value of Jesus and what other people uh, went through because they counted him you know, more than all the world combined. So I, I just I think about how, how are we going to be healthy you know, walking through this season? Well, I think it's only our part of the wall, pursuing our calling. But I think, too, it's, it's fixing our eyes on God. Reading a book that challenges your mind to help you see the holiness, the beauty, the love of God in a fresh new way. Going for a, going for a walk. Uh, I think about even, too, just getting outside of our heads. like turning your living room into a place of worship. Mm, yeah. Right? I mean, it, you know, if, if you're married with your spouse, if you have kids with your kids, if it's just you, just you. Like but turning that into a secret place. Music's jamming, and you're just like your heart is connecting with our King. Like these are ways that we can pursue our calling uh, and break out of you know break out of this kind of melancholy traps that the enemy wants to set. You know, it it, it shatters the mirror, right? It, well, when our eyes are on God, it shatters the mirror. And that's yeah, that's my hope for for our church right now is that is that we would embrace our calling, but our hearts we. It, just because we're quarantined doesn't mean that our hearts can't be filled with joy. It, it, it can be. It's going to be more challenging. It's going to be a fight for sure. But there's still this invitation that, that where we can connect with God and with people despite the season we're in. Paul, man, like what would be something you're praying about right now? For, you know, As we're closing, we've, we've talked about our calling, talked about ways that we can work out this calling. What would be uh, a prayer for King Saul right now? You know, when I think about prayer, uh, I think about a phrase you, you just mentioned, the, the secret place. And I think we see that so clearly demonstrated in Nehemiah. Chapter 1, what does he do for four months? He spends time in the secret mm -hmm. place. And I was just reading in Matthew chapter 5 where Jesus says, When you pray, go into the closet. And your Father who sees you in secret will give you a reward. And if we're going to talk about prayer, I, I would just go up the next tier and think about the joy we can have in prayer in the secret place because the Father's ready to give the reward, His presence. And so we can talk about what to pray, but I think first we, we have to realize the gift that prayer is. And uh, as I've heard you mention lately, that one of the reasons Jesus died is so that when we pray, we can enter into the presence of God. And so, man, that should give us all the motivation to pray. But specifically, Carly and I have just been praying that we wouldn't grow apathetic 
it is so easy to, to turn on Netflix. Some Netflix is fine. Don't hear me condemning all Netflix. But it would just be easy to turn on the TV and, and just give into apathy right now. So we're praying specifically that that wouldn't happen with us. But we also know that the, the way we stay away from apathy is we stay close to Jesus. So we're praying hard that we would stay close to him. And that takes sometimes getting up early, even though we could sleep in. Uh, and, and committing ourselves to meeting with Him. So we're praying against apathy, and we're praying that we would stay close to Him, and we're praying on, for opportunities on how to bless other people. Because again, it'd be so easy to be internally focused right now, but we're really praying that God would open our eyes to what's around us. But Carly and I are also praying for King's Hill. So I want you to hear that. We're praying for you. Uh, we are praying that you would grow right now, that we, we all together would grow in community, and we would grow in mission. And, and I, I think the, the phrase I keep coming back to is that we would not dismiss this time. I think from a worldly standpoint, from, from worldly logic and worldly wisdom, uh, I would be tempted to look at this situation with the virus and say, there's no way God could work right now. There's no way the church could grow. Uh, there's no way God could do a mighty work right now. But I'm praying for us in King's Hill that we would have that faith. What's our, our call is to... See generations follow God with bold faith. That's why we exist as a church, to see people follow God with a bold faith. And bold faith says right now, God can do a mighty work. We're stuck in our homes, but God can do a mighty work. He can do a mighty work with me in the secret place, and he can do a mighty work for my neighbor. He can do a mighty work for my coworkers. And that's how movements work. It's one person owning the wall next to their brother and sister owning their wall, and then the wall gets built in 52 days. So we're praying really hard that God would do a mighty work, that he would give you and me eyes to see that he is not limited and he's not bound by the things we see around us. Yeah, man, what a great word. Just uh, stay close to Jesus, mm -hmm. fixing our eyes on him, uh, embracing our calling in, in small ways, and, and, and God has laid out a path for our joy, even in seasons like this, and for us to say, all right, I'm going to follow you. Hey, can you, can you just pray for those things as we close our time? Absolutely. God, because we are loved by you, we pray that we would love you in return. We pray that our hearts would be filled up in your love and that that would root out all apathy. God, I pray for the family of Kings Hill. God, I pray that we would have bold faith, that we would dare to believe you want to do even greater works right now. And God, I pray for the church around the world. God, you see your suffering people. I pray that you would comfort your suffering people, that your family would live as family, that we would care for one another in the grief, in the hurt, and in the pain, and that the world would, would see the love we have for one another. That's what Jesus said, that, that they will know you're my disciples by the love you have for one another. So I pray that the world would watch as your people love each other in radical ways during a crazy time of life. God, I thank you for Jonathan. I thank you for King Hill. I thank you for your word and for your provision in your word. Like You give us uh, life through your word. So I'm just so thankful for that gift. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus, our high priest. Amen.